Uh, look, uh, one and a half degree is extremely challenging. I mean, we've had already one degree of warming. One and a half degree would mean completely decarbonizing the economy in just a few decades. Do we have the knowledge? We do. Do we have the technology in large part? Can we actually build the infrastructure and make the development, the political decision, the social transformations that are needed in just a few decades? I'm not sure. Still, we're in a good position. Uh, the global emissions have stalled in the past two years. Now we need to reverse the emissions. We need to decrease them, bring them down to zero. So it's not impossible, but it's a lot of work. So in my presentation today, I, I focused on the physical climate science approach and I stressed what we already know, especially from the IPCC AR5, but also where there are gaps. And uh, there are gaps about uh, implications of rates of changes, including overshoot. There are gaps sometimes for the most vulnerable areas, countries, people, um, especially small islands. So new research is being developed, but we need more progress to provide a quantitative approach. Uh, for these specific situations. Um, I also stressed the need for better knowledge for some aspects of the climate system, like the Arctic sea ice, the Antarctic sea ice, glaciers, threshold for uh, Greenland ice sheet destabilization. That's make a link between the need for more curiosity-driven research, process-based understanding, so that it better informs the implications for different warming targets on the policy side. I think we, uh, we can say a lot about the impacts directly related to temperature. So extreme hot days, hot nights, um, also cold nights and cold days where, where that is relevant. We can probably also uh, say a lot about the shift of, um, of seasons, if you want. So when, when we expect the hot days and hot nights to occur, which I think might on the impact side even be more interesting than just the pure magnitude of that. Um, we can say a lot about uh, the increase in heavy precipitation and I think there is also where we see a lot of difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. And I think Sonia said earlier that we don't know that much about storms yet but I think that is an area where especially with a lot of the attribution work and, some th and, and things that uh, people like Gabe Becky at GFDL have been doing, we will probably be able to say more in, in the actual report in a year when we talk about impacts than we can today. Well, in some gross technical sense, if it really meant 1.5 degrees global temperature rise and that's all, I think it's actually technically very feasible. So I work on these technologies for so-called solar geoengineering, the idea that we could make the Earth a little bit more reflective to uh, cool down the planet and reduce climate risks. And there are lots of uncertainties about how we govern that technology, about how it reduces individual risks. But it's actually, I think, pretty certain that it would reduce temperature. So if truly the target just meant 1.5 C, then I think you can meet it with certainty if you have the ability to do solar geoengineering, which is something we pretty much have the ability to do. Now, obviously, there's been a kind of widespread commitment not to talk about that technology. So it's sort of really been pushed out of the IPCC conversation and mostly out of the conversation at this meeting for reasons that may or may not be good. Uh, I guess the second thing to say is that I don't really see the 1.5 degree target as, as a sort of strict quantitative target. I think it was an attempt for negotiators to say, we really care about this issue. We care about it a lot. I don't think anybody involved at a really high level believes there's kind of a hard quantitative target that will be binding and kind of directly mean something. Uh, but I think it, it, actually I was very excited by the Paris result. I think it really does mean uh, a step forward in the level of attention and, and ambition for people to cut emissions. Well, I think the important thing to take into account here is the timescales at which you look and um, we know already from the literature that the risk is quite different also for extreme events. So maybe while the, the mean difference between 1.5 and 2 is not so big, the risk one runs, for example, for, uh, to have uh, extreme events that are outside the historical experience is much higher. And then also the other timescale one needs to look at is, for example, uh, those impacts that have a cumulative effect, for example, sea level rise. It's not just the moment we reach 1.5, but where, how long we sustain a, a higher warming level. And so I think there, there is good evidence that these impacts can be quite different.
I think if we think about impact of 1.5 and 2 degrees, one also needs to think about impacts of 1.5 and 2 degree pathways. For example, if we aim for 1.5, we still have a chance, maybe 10%, that we end up above 2 degrees or even more. If we aim for 2 degrees, we might still en end up with a 10% chance to get to 3 degrees. So we also have to think about those impacts that are actually avoided by aiming for a 1.5 or a 2 degree pathway.